Uh, hello, I am uh, I am uh, I work in the Institute for International Studies. It's a part of um, GIMO. GIMO is a main diplomatic school in Russia, but we are dealing mostly with the research. We are working as a think tank uh, for uh, Russian foreign ministry. And I was trained as an expert in China, and uh, you know, perhaps it's a very hot season for China watchers all over the world. It's the flu season, or <laughs> coronavirus to be exact. <laughs> and uh, I think that outbreak of a uh, new disease uh, has shown how everything that happens in China, positive or negative, uh, is important to the world, and how closely China has become connected to the world, and also how small this world is. In my presentation, I would like to raise several questions. Uh, first one is how important Russia is for China and China for Russia. The second, what is the nature of relations between the two countries and whether Moscow and Beijing are ready to create a, some kind of military alliance. And uh, the third question is what are the limitations of the development of relations, whether the two countries always look at the world the same way. I think the current stage can be separated uh, from the history of relations between Russia and China, and uh, personal friendships between leaders can be completely separated from the foundation uh, of the relations. Whether countries see each other as rivals or partners, whether or not they trust each other. I think the, um, an indicator of the high level of trust between the countries is a cooperation in the military and military technical fields, and it began long, long ago uh, in the 90s. I think the key issue, it's, it's obvious to say that the key issue is the border settlement. I think uh, uh, stable situation in the Russian-Chinese border is extremely important for China because, you know, they have uh, problems, uh, territorial, territorial conflicts with almost every, every neighbor. So the settlement of the border issue paved the way for deep cooperation for some kind of strategic uh, partnership. Uh, for China, confidence in good relations uh, with its largest ne neighbor in the uh, north, as I said, is extremely uh, important. And we can indeed descri describe Vladimir Putin's relationship with Xi Jinping as very warm and filled with personal amity and signs of mutual sympathy. But coming to power, politicians receive a ready portfolio of bilateral relations from their predecessor. I think the main reason for the current warmth of the relations between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin is largely determined by the kind of Sino-Russian relations they have had to deal with. Uh, at the same time, uh, the development of the global situation only convince the leaders of Russia and China that the choice made by their predecessors, not always together, but never against each other, is the right one. And uh, this decision was uh, fixed in the Treaty of 2001. By the way, it was uh, signed by, uh, during the first term of Vladimir Putin with Jiang Zemin. And it was a clear sign uh, of uh, special relations between uh, two countries in which deep cooperation in the political, economic, and humanitarian areas is combined with mutual desire to avoid the creation of military alliance. So the partnership framework is rather flexible, and specific content of the partnership may vary depending on the domestic needs, on the situation on the international arena, at the same time, the construction is stable because it's based on shared views on the key issues of the world politics. At the same time, it doesn't rule out differences on some questions. For example, uh, uh, China uh, didn't recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it didn't influence uh, our relations in general. Uh, so, most likely, the provisions of the 2001 treaty, so-called big treaty, on the non-bloc nature of Russian-Chinese uh, relations will remain relevant uh, in the near future. Uh, but uh, it doesn't exclude any dif uh, differences uh, between the position uh, of uh, Russia and China. For example, Chinese side objects to the term uh, friendly neutrality. It was proposed uh, by some Russian researchers, 
which assumes a neutral but de facto approving position in those areas where opportunities for open support are absent. But uh, they objected to this uh, formula, friendly neutrality. In official Chinese statements, uh, the position uh, on Ukraine and the Crimea is called just and fair. So relations with Russia are included by China in a broader context and, and can't be spoken on neutrality. Uh, so can't, we can't spoke about unchanging position that doesn't depend on Russia's specific actions. Now I would like to cite an interesting example that came out of the observation of Chinese translation of Russian official statement, statements made after the uh, decision of a permanent court of arbitration on uh, South China Sea. Russia has repeatedly stated that it's not a party to the conflict in the South China Sea, doesn't take a position of any one party. And uh, there was a statement by the representative of for our foreign ministry, uh, Maria, Maria Zakharova, uh, and uh, there was a bit of criticism uh, in the, this statement because Maria Zakharova said that uh, international law should be, ex uh, should be applied consistently. But it's very interesting that China, in Chinese official translated, it was translated like rationally. So a rational use of uh, international law and consistent use uh, of international is not, not, not just uh, the same. Uh, and finally, I would like to mention the military dimension of the Russian-Chinese uh, partnership. Uh, a disclaimer would be appropriate here because I'm not a military expert and I rely mainly on what is officially published by the Ministry of Defense as well as opinions of our military experts. Uh, I can draw your attention to participation of Chinese military in strategic military exercises. Uh, it's East 2018 uh, uh, and Center 2019. It was a new evidence of strengthening uh, military cooperation. And it's important because these exercises are the main internal exercises and are included in the Russian Army training plan. So, Mm, it's worth noting, however, that Moscow has demonstrated it, its desire uh, not to make these exercises exclusively Russian-Chinese. And apparently China is comfortable with it. In the first exercises, uh, it was attended by Mongolia, whose policy is exactly a balancing between China and Russia. And the second exercises last year was broader in terms of participants, uh, including India and Pakistan, by the way. And also Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, starting from 2015, the exercises of Russia and China are sometimes held away from their borders. However, such turn is taking place in, in line with the increasing presence of European allies of the United States in Asia. In 2016, the United Kingdom and France uh, sharply stepped up their policy on the Pacific Ocean and took a critical stance with respect to China on the issue of South China Sea. In March 2017, France sent, sent a Mistral to the Western Pacific for joint exercises with the US, Japan, and the UK. So European activity on the other side of the world didn't seem to have delighted China and played its part in the decision to send a Chinese fleet to the Baltic and Mediterranean. During the Valdai Club meeting, Russian President Putin uh, acknowledged that Russia had helped China develop m missile early warning system. The details of the cooperation are not disclosed, so we don't know how deep it was, what consultations were provided, and what equipment was transferred. But um, uh, even exact date of the uh, cooperation ag agreement is not clear. But Russia and China already have a certain history of cooperation in the field of uh, theater missile defense. Russia has acquired Russian, uh, China has uh, acquired Russian anti-aircraft missile systems. And since 2016, the two countries have conducted joint exercises on, of air defense and missile defense forces in the form of computer simulations. Due to the huge sensitivity of the relevant technologies, countries rarely cooperate in this area. And assistance in building a national early warning system indicates an unprecedented level of uh, cooperation. But the most important issue is the possible integration of the two systems. It's not clear. 
uh, when, when it will be integrated together. But uh, as uh, now about technology a little bit. As stated in the GMO report, International Threats 2012, uh, 2020, the world is in the process of forming alliances to compete in the new technology cycle. Uh, these alliances uh, or techno-economic blocks, they are based on uh, technology, competing technology platforms and tools built on them. It's clear that one of these blocks will be formed around China and how should Russia act? I think this is a more difficult question than determining the limits of military cooperation. Uh, the question of choosing a partner in the 5G area hasn't yet been settled yet in, in Russia, but Huawei has a good position. But as in many other countries, the most suitable frequency range for 5G is owned by the military and Ministry of Defense has already made it clear that only Russian-made equipment can operate on these frequencies. So this means that there's no special relations with Huawei or special uh, preferences. And finally, I think, uh, to return to the question of alliance, the topic of the alliance was raised in a recent Russian-Chinese documents and joint statements adopted after Xi Jinping visit last year states that Russia and China in the development of relations are guided, among other things, by the principle of not creating uh, an alliance. Such turn, full alliance, is not beneficial for Moscow, which is uh, interested in developing energy and military technical cooperation not only with China but also with other countries of the Asia-Pacific region as well as European Union. Thank you very much.